Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. Welcome to our first screencast on vagueness and context dependence. Now, vagueness is something we've confronted throughout the quarter, and I've mostly tried to steer around it. Well, it's time to address it head on to the extent that that's possible. I've paired vagueness and context dependence here for this unit, and the view I'll take is that vagueness is controlled by context dependence to some extent. The context is what we look to to help resolve vagueness as much as possible. For the first two screencasts in the unit, we'll cover high-level ideas and concepts related to vagueness and context dependence, and then we'll turn to our reading, the Soret et al. paper, Meaning and Context in Children's Understanding of Gradable Adjectives. And that'll be a look at some experimental evidence that reveals some new ways in which vagueness is resolved or controlled by language in context. To kick things off, I thought it would be fun to start with some excerpts from this outstanding New Yorker article, Utopian for Beginners, by Joshua Foer. A lot of people have the intuition that vagueness and related notions like ambiguity are problems with language rather than virtues of them, and maybe they sort of dream of being able to speak without vagueness or ambiguity. Well, this article is about someone who took that idea to the limit by inventing a language called Ithcul that has none of these properties. It's meant to be precise and unambiguous in all instances. The person behind this is John Quijada. He's the inventor of Ithcul. And so the article begins, languages are something of a mess. They evolve over centuries through an unplanned democratic process that leaves them teeming with irregularities, quirks, and words like night. I like that. Uh, a sensible and intuitive summary of the way linguistic convention arises. And then a bit later in the article, it says, In his preface, Quijada wrote that his greater goal was to attempt the creation of what human beings, left to their own devices, would never create naturally, but rather only by conscious intellectual effort, an idealized language whose aim is the highest possible degree of logic, efficiency, detail and accuracy in cognitive expression via spoken human language, while minimizing the ambiguity, vagueness, illogic, redundancy, polysemy, that is multiple meanings, and overall arbitrariness that is seemingly ubiquitous in natural human language. And the article continues, and we learn that Ithcul has gained a dedicated group of followers. And then the article returns to more snippets of Ithcul linguistic description. So this is the heart of it. If you imagine all the possible notions, ideas, beliefs, and statements that a human mind could ever express, Ithcul provides a precise set of coordinates for pinpointing any one of those thoughts. The final version of Ithcul, which Quijada published in 2011, has 22 grammatical categories for verbs compared with the six tense, aspect, person, number, mood, and voice that exist in English, 1,800 distinct suffixes further refine a speaker's intent, and through a process of laborious conjugation that would befuddle even the most competent Latin grammarian, Ithcul requires a speaker to home in on the exact idea he means to express and attempts to remove any possibility for vagueness. I just love this. What emerges in the article is that no one can really speak Ithcul, even Quijada. It's just too demanding in terms of memory, and it has to have a vast stock of sounds and lexical items just so it will have enough terms to describe things without ambiguity or context dependence. And then we get to the heart of it. Human interactions are governed by a set of implicit codes that can sometimes seem frustratingly opaque and whose misreading can quickly put you on the outside looking in. Irony, metaphor, ambiguity, these are the ingenious instruments that allow us to mean more than we say. But in Ithcul, ambiguity is quashed in the interest of making all that is implicit explicit. An ironic statement is tagged with the verbal affix ksh. Hyperbolic statements are inflected with the letter m. Mm. <laughs> this is just lovely. Uh, unfortunately, we don't find out whether the sarcasm marker has ended up being used primarily for meta-sarcasm. That's the usual fate of proposed sarcasm punctuation markers. Anyway, this degree of precision might seem appealing, but recall that this leads to such a high degree of complexity that no one can really use Ithcul to communicate. To my mind, it's a sort of reductio ad absurdum of the whole idea that vagueness is a problem rather than a virtue. And indeed, Parti says this well in our reading from the start of the quarter. It is also worth noting that as one studies how vagueness works in more detail, one quickly overcomes the common prejudice that vagueness is always a bad thing, that it is some kind of defect of natural language. Exactly. When you hear vagueness and ambiguity in language, you should think of the incredible flexibility that it facilitates, 
where we can use a relatively small set of lexical items to talk about pretty much any state of affairs in the universe. How do we do it though? How do we resolve this vagueness and, and indeed ambiguity? Well, we look to the context to tell us what is meant in the moment. And we do that so effortlessly that we often don't even notice that we're doing it. And indeed, let me build on that final point, in fact, here. So the crux of this is that vagueness is a natural and productive response to a complex and varied world. Right? For example, here's a chart from the World Color Survey. The different colors shade into each other. The greens transition into the blues, the blues into the purples, the purples into the pinks, and so forth. And for all the patches we see in this display, there are others that could sit between them that we could dis distinguish perceptually. Right, the color space is effectively continuous. So what are we going to do? Are we going to have a word for every perceptually distinguishable patch? That is sure to fail. That's like the Ithkiel strategy. What we do instead is work with a relatively small set of color terms, and we use modifiers to add nuance, and we accept that precise identification might be hard due to vagueness. But what we get in exchange is a useful and flexible system for describing colors. Just about every concept has some aspects of vagueness. For example, check out this display of different cups. It's from a famous study by Bill Lebov in which he used survey responses to try to delimit what counts as a cup and a mug. Right, so which of these is a mug for you? I'd say that item 10 is a clear mug and item 17 is a clear non-mug. But there may be all sorts of uncertainty in gray areas there, cases like item 16 and maybe item 18, uh, where we just can't tell whether they count as mugs or not. And in different contexts, you might find your own criteria shifting, especially if you think about your own goals for these artifacts. And of course, we confronted vagueness a lot when we talked about quantificational determiners. This XKCD cartoon is a nice reminder of that. What precisely counts as a few? Well, there may not be precision about that question at all. I want to turn now to the friendly partner of vagueness, which is context and context dependence. But first, it's worth posing this central philosophical question. What is the nature of vagueness? Is vagueness epistemic? That is a reflection of our partial knowledge of what are actually crisp concepts. Or is it metaphysical? That is a fundamental feature of our reality. It's very difficult to tease these apart in many cases. The first implies a highly structured universe that we have fuzzy knowledge of, whereas the second says that it's gray areas all the way down and all the way through. Now, for the most part, this won't matter. I do tend toward physical perspective myself, but I think the linguistic angles I want to take don't actually commit me strongly to this viewpoint. Okay, on to context dependence. Now, this might sound like we're adding in more uncertainty, and in a way we are, but the net effect is to help with vagueness resolution, I think. So consider the pair of sentences in one. The first is, George the tortoise is fast, and the second is, Usain Bolt is fast. So George is a tortoise that lives in my neighborhood, and Usain Bolt is the fastest person on earth right now, as far as we know. George can probably get up to about a half a mile per hour, and Usain Bolt can get up to like 27 miles per hour when he's running fast. So how can these sentences both be true? Well, the predicate fast is vague, and the context is helping us to resolve that vagueness. In the terms I've given here, the context is expected to provide a comparison class for predicates like this, and the standards we maintain are then calibrated with reference to that comparison class. So for 1A, our comparison class is likely to be other tortoises. Uh, if we change that comparison class to land mammals or humans, then this sentence about George is going to come out false, since George is very slow relative to the standards of those larger groups. But he stacks up well relative to the tortoises. Similarly, 1B is naturally evaluated relative to humans, and it might seem false if the comparison class includes cheetahs or Formula One race cars. These are maybe unlikely contexts, but if we found ourselves in such contexts, I think we'd find it pretty easy to shift around our standards for fast accordingly by shifting around the nature of the comparison class. Final note about this. There can be linguistic clues as to the comparison class, but the context is always the ultimate mediator. Uh, Kennedy gives this clear example, expensive BMW. This has a sense in which the comparison class is applied by BMW, and then the car we're talking about is expensive even by the standards of that very expensive group of cars. But it also has a sense in which the comparison class, class is more like cars in general. The car in question might be the cheapest BMW, but still count as expensive for a car in general. 
In three, I've inserted a reminder that we've seen vagueness before when we talked about determiners. Our meanings for few and many are vague as a result of having this pragmatic free variable in them. In general, this variable can take on many very distinct values, and so there's always some vagueness that creates uncertainty about what was communicated with these determiners, precisely what the standards were. And approximately 10 and almost no are intrinsically vague, since they don't convey what the standard is for being close enough. For all these cases, the context, including the other words in the sentence, will likely help us by helping us to figure out what the standard the speaker had in mind was, and also constraining speakers to stick within a certain range of values if they want to be understood in context. Okay, now that we have our two main players, let's return to the core theme of the Ithuel piece. What I've done in this little chart here is try to set up a framework for us to see how these two concepts, vagueness and context dependence, interact. And just to forecast how this is going to go, I think we're going to find that almost everything belongs up here with tall as being very vague and very context dependent. But let me see if I can map this out persuasively nonetheless. Along the x-axis, I have vagueness, where the farther to the right you go, the more vague you are. And on the y-axis, I have context dependence. And here, the higher you go, the more context dependent you are. Okay. My candidate for maximally non-vague and non-context dependent, the item in the lower left corner, is rhomboid. This is a specialized mathematical term that seems like it would have a very crisp definition within mathematics that has nothing to do with the context. But notice that I had to pick a very specialized mathematical term. For instance, I obviously couldn't choose a rectangle because we would immediately get into a context-dependent tangle regarding whether rectangle includes squares in terms of what gets communicated or, or implicated. Okay, let's travel to the right on the vagueness scale. Here I propose dead as an adjective that is pretty vague, but not so context dependent. So the idea here is that the standard for dead and alive is pretty universal, but we also find plenty of gray area cases of things that are not quite alive and not quite dead. For the converse of this, we want something that is low on vagueness and high on context dependence. And here I propose the adjective legal. The thinking here is that the laws of the land change from place to place on the globe, often in very extreme ways. And so we have a lot of context dependence for this adjective. However, we might expect or at least hope that the laws in each case are pretty well specified so that what counts as legal versus illegal is pretty clear and doesn't have a large gray area. This is probably wishful thinking, but perhaps that description at least conveys what it would be like to be highly context dependent, but not very vague. And finally, the upper right is for the things with lots of vagueness and lots of context dependence. And with apologies to the Ithcule enthusiasts, this is where most of the lexicon of most of the world's languages will be found. Almost everything is vague and context dependent to some non-trivial degree. As Partee says here, even the line between vague and non-vague predicates is vague. A concept may count as sharp for most purposes, but vague relative to the demands of scientific or legal or philosophical argument. Probably almost every predicate is both vague and context dependent to some degree. So we are indeed awash in vagueness, but I urge you not to worry about that.